protect in this crisis and say, look, you owe us. We took care of your security problems and we don't want to have to come back and do this again. Wars do change things. That will happen now in the Middle East and like it or not, the United States is going to be squarely in the middle of the process. Tom? Sean Dancy, once the shooting begins, there is the fog of combat, and once diplomacy begins, there's the fog of diplomacy as well. Is there a planning group already at work on all of this? There are people who are talking about what will happen at the end of this war, and of course, this war will end, as all wars do, Tom, ultimately with diplomacy. But yes, the United States is already looking ahead to the period when the war ends and the diplomacy begins. Thank you very much, John Dancy at the State Department tonight. In a moment, Jane Pauley on America at War. And are dumping oil into the Persian Gulf at the rate of more than 4 million gallons a day. On the potential effect, here's ABC's Ned Potter. The oil was so thick it gurgled as it washed onto the Gulf shoreline. It coated seabirds, sent fumes high into the air, and provoked angry words from the president about Saddam Hussein. Now he resorts to uh, enormous environmental damage uh, by, in terms of uh, turning loose a lot of oil. No military advantage to, to him whatsoever in this. It's not going to help him at all. Absolutely not. The Pentagon said the crude oil was apparently being released from an export terminal off the Kuwaiti coast. It had mostly spread toward the Saudi shoreline from there, carried by local currents. This is clearly an act of environmental terrorism, and it's likely to be more than a dozen times bigger than the Alaska oil spill at Valdez. Military sources say oil on the shoreline would not greatly hamper a ground assault because oil spills are hard to set on fire and most troops would likely land by helicopter or hovercraft. But heavy equipment like tanks might be hampered. The Pentagon said it's already at work on ways around the problem. Environmentalists and pollution experts had other concerns in mind. The Sierra Club, for instance, said the dumping could destroy the Gulf for decades, limiting fishing and the food supply. And if it spread far enough down the Gulf, the oil could clog desalination plants that supply most of the region's drinking water. This is a situation where the spillage is intentional, deliberate, and as a result, it could continue for as long as the hostilities continue. As a result, it has the potential for becoming one of the most severe environmental disasters in history. Late today, an oil spill cleanup firm in Texas confirmed it has received a call from the Saudi government for help in clearing its beaches. Ned Potter, ABC News, Washington. Still in the Middle East, four more attacks today apparently related to the war. In the Greek capital, Athens, bombs went off at three banks, two U.S. and one British, and at the home of the French military attaché. There was some damage. No one was hurt. The State Department has added India to the list of countries where it thinks anti-American violence may occur as the result of the war. And it says Americans planning to visit India should postpone their trips and those who are there should consider leaving until, in the department's words, the Gulf crisis abates. It's moving south. One source said every plant on the Saudi Peninsula to convert salt water to domestic use is threatened. A half a million American troops need lots of water. Those the plants that are located close to the oil, and the oil is relatively fresh, packed is potentially large since it fouls the flash evaporation plants and clogs the membranes on the reverse osmosis plants. But the Pentagon's General Tom Kelly scoffed at the military significance of the oil disaster. Uh, we have not come up with a final course of action. We do feel strongly that it's not going to have an impact on military operations. Other Pentagon sources say there is a big military worry. Allied warships sailing through the oil slick may develop problems with water intakes used for steam cooling systems. U.S. warplanes, specifically the stealth fighter bomber, could be ordered to attack the oil terminals, the pipelines, and storage tanks to stop the oil sabotage. There is a great reluctance to attack the Kuwaiti facilities because one of the major goals of this war is to save what is left of Kuwait. Tom? And Fred, you have some late for information for us tonight on Iraq and its old enemy, Iran? That's right, Tom. U.S. intelligence officials are telling me that uh, they're, they're looking northeast now to Iran, that some of the Iraqi aircraft that have been evading U.S. planes have been flying into Iran for safe refuge, and not just to hide out in the air, but actually landing at Iranian airfields, apparently with the consent of the Iranian government. So it is a worrisome development. It has been going on for several days, not just warplanes, but large Iraqi transport planes landing in Iran. Tom? Thank you. Fred Francis of the Pentagon tonight. 
The most devastating part of the war today we couldn't see. That was the Allied air attack on Iraq and its military positions in Kuwait. It was the busiest day for these air raids so far. NBC's Arthur Kent is in Saudi Arabia now with what the Allies see as some encouraging signs. Arthur? Tom, senior officers were more upbeat here today, claiming that the constant pounding they've been giving to Iraqi military targets is producing tangible results. After nine days of air assault, Allied war planners say Saddam Hussein's command and control systems are crumbling. Uh, they've been severely degraded so that uh, the means of communication is slow uh, and in ineffective and inefficient in terms of running a fast and moving mobile battle. But some military analysts point out that the Iraqi strength is digging in, resisting attack, and that in the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam Hussein did not rely on complex command structures. The Allies are pounding Iraqi air and ground forces that are likely acting on general orders given them before the war began. Today, however, initial signs that Saddam Hussein's troops are under pressure from bombing. There is certainly evidence from the prisoners that we've captured, from a certain number of defectors that have come across, that there are substantial numbers of Iraqis who would like to see the end of this war. One shift in Allied tactics, British tornadoes will fly fewer low-level raids. Five tornadoes have been lost to ground fire. The British say, with the Iraqi Air Force grounded at present, the risk far outweighs the benefit of these missions. Elsewhere, however, Allied pilots are scoring hits. The British commander here stopped just short of pity when speaking of Iraqi troops today. Condemned to their bunkers, he said, unable to withdraw, unable to surrender, because their leader won't let them. Tom? Looks a little windy there tonight, uh, Arthur Kent. What's the weather conditions and the forecast for tomorrow? Very windy, very cold. That's going to be a complicating factor, as always, in air operations. Not so much for guided bombs, for smart bombs, but for free-falling ordnance and uh, a complication the Air Forces don't need. And what about bomb damage assessment? We keep hearing that phrase. Are you getting much of that information there at your end? Not much. We see some of it trickling back in terms of uh, Sir Peter's comments about the command and contr co control structure breaking down in Iraq and Kuwait. But really detailed assessment is going to take a, a longer period of time to see not only the effects to buildings, but also how the troops and how their commanders adapt to them. And that takes a, a period of time, period of days of observation. NBC's Arthur Kent tonight in Daharan. He uses these Scud missiles that have no military value whatsoever. Then he uses the lives of prisoners of war, parading them and threatening to use them as shields. Uh, obviously, they have been brutalized. Mr. Bush saved some of his strongest words for the oil spill in the Gulf, remembering no doubt that U.S. environmentalists had warned that war could bring just such an occurrence. This thing today troubles me very much because there's no rationality to it. It looks desperate. It looks last gasp. It's a, it's a, it doesn't measure up to any military doctrine of any kind, uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of sick. The president's case for intervening in the Gulf has rested heavily on the idea that Saddam Hussein is a monster who must be stopped. The White House believes tonight that Saddam's conduct this past week has gone a long way to prove that case. Britt Hume, ABC News, the White House. We'll have more news. Down 10 Allied planes and missiles. The Iraqis say its troops were not forced off a Kuwaiti island that Allied forces claimed to have captured yesterday. They left voluntarily, according to the Iraqis and Iraqi civilians are being hit by Allied air attacks. Here's ABC's Sheila McVicker. Iraq continued to try to make its point about civilian casualties and damage today, approving the release of these pictures. Western television crews still in Baghdad were taken to this residential neighborhood where the Iraqis say two houses were completely destroyed, six others seriously damaged, three people hurt. These Iraqis no longer believe Allied claims of targeting only military sites. We were really surprised, she says. This is just a place where people live. After more than a week of repeated attacks, people in Baghdad seem to be adjusting. When the sirens sound, 
most people no longer scramble for cover. Some shops have reopened, but food is scarce and there is no electricity. Journalist Lami Sandoni left Baghdad yesterday. She says Iraqis are leading a simpler life. They're going back to the way they used to live in the rural areas before the modern facilities. And this is not very difficult for Iraqis since it hasn't been very long ago. And Iraqis told her in spite of the sacrifices the war has forced on them, they will stand with Saddam Hussein. Because for them this is the battle of life and death. This is an, their sovereignty is at stake. And uh, they might be critical of him, some of them might not like him but they're behind him. To bolster morale, Iraqi television broadcasts pictures like this. But the Iraqi government also knows it is responsible for the safety of downed allied airmen. So to discourage beatings and worse, the government reward for pilots turned in unharmed has been raised to $90,000. While Iraqis try to cope with the war, thousands of foreigners try to flee. The border with Jordan is still closed. Some people have been trapped on the Iraqi side without food or gasoline for nearly three days. A Western diplomat said if the refugees are unable to get out, there may be what he called a large-scale human tragedy. Sheila McVicker, ABC News, Amman. There is a report on the front page of today's Washington Post that Allied forces may have pinpointed Saddam Hussein's location one night last week, but were prevented from attacking because of bad weather. The military in Saudi Arabia today said it wasn't true. President Bush said today the U.S. is not in the business of targeting the Iraqi leader personally. Other military sources have told us if the U.S. does get Hussein, it'll be by accident, which does not mean he is completely safe. Here's ABC's John Martin. U.S. military officials insist Saddam Hussein himself is not a target. Assassination is against United States law but his whereabouts are a vital piece of military intelligence. The CIA has a task force watching Iraq. It has not been...